imitation psalm tonight will be number 218. Number 218. Good evening, brethren, friends. We've got a good crowd when you consider just absolutely how nasty the weather is outside. But it certainly is good to see you. And we are in 1 Peter chapter 5. If you'd like to be opening your Bibles there, 1 Peter chapter 5. Good to see everyone. If you are not getting the uh, email that's being sent out by uh, Daniel Gaines for his work in Tanzania, let me encourage you to uh, email him and ask for a copy of that. We're also... I'm going to try to run some off when I, I just got it today, so I'm going to flash drive it here to the office and print some. But uh, it really, uh, Tiffany has a piece in there this time about, uh, you know, putting off tomorrow, you know, those things that you need to do today. And she's talking about, you know, how at times she'd ask Daniel, you know, uh, well, let's wait, you know, till the kids are grown up or there's a better time. And she goes on and uses several different scenarios. But the bottom line is they have an opportunity to do a great work. And uh, it's an, L an established work over there. And so uh, I'm glad that we're supporting it and hoping we can support it in uh, even bigger and better ways in the future. Uh, Daniel, you know, is just going to do a great job in uh, teaching over there. I know some people that are over there right now. And, uh, of course, it was good to see him at the lectures. Appreciate you all allowing me to go to the lectures. I think uh, if me and Robbie didn't uh, put in at least eight hours a day in, in, in uh in uh, going to the lectures and listening to the gospel, we at least ate that much. Because uh, I tell you what, <laughs> we, we definitely had a good time. And if you'd ever like to go with us, it's always the first full week in February. And uh, we'd love to have you go and uh, help split up the cost. <laughs> but we certainly have a good time. And it's always a spiritual uh, blessing. Uh, and you, you would have a good time, too. The, the frustrating or the interesting thing, I wouldn't say frustrating, but it's so out of place this year. It's so unseasonably warm uh, just all over the southeast. I guess you couldn't tell that to the northeast people right now, but uh, it certainly was a good time and appreciate you all allowing me to do that. We're looking at First Peter chapter 5, and we're going to break this chapter down into just take the first four verses tonight because you have here a, a very important piece of scripture, one that is often used by people who I think uh, are leading the church away from what it needs to be, especially when it comes to the roles of elders. Now, uh, this kicked around a couple hundred years ago. There was a fellow by the name of, uh, his name leaves me now, but he was writing against a series of articles that Brother, Brother McGarvey had written about the uh, church and how the church should be run. At, uh, I want to say tent, but I believe that's the wrong... I believe that's the wrong writer. Well, anyway, so that was battled out about 150 years ago. But more recently, in our, in our day and age, uh, Rule Lemons, who was the firm foundation editor for a number of years, uh, and I'd have to say when it was extremely to the left, uh, wrote a series of articles basically saying that the eldership uh, has no authority. They only have the authority in that they can be an example. And, of course, one of the passages that they try to use would be First Peter chapter 5. And I don't believe that uh, that even touches the hem of the garment. Now, a couple of things, if you're, you know, if we play this on YouTube, right, some things I'd like to bring out is that there's some excellent material. 2006, uh, a lectureship's Garland Elkins from the, uh, it used to be the Denton Lectures, but now it's the Shirts Lectures. They put out a book, and, and it's just a real good lectureship. Garland Elkins writes an uh, article on the authority of elders, and he prints in its entirety, volume 9, number 3 of the 1978 uh, Spiritual Sword, in which that whole issue was dedicated to the authority of elders. And the reason I say that, if you have an opportunity to get online, if you get a chance to look at those things, they are good material. If you're interested in even more reading about this uh, matter, I'd be happy to uh, make you copies of everything that I have in regards to that. Because there has been some division in our brotherhood. And it's one of those situations, I think, where it is when something is, is right. Say, for instance, the husband's role in the home. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and gave himself for it. We understand that. We call that positional authority. But are there rascal husbands out there? Well, you better believe it. 
There, somebody over here gave me a big amen. That wasn't you, was it, Steph? Okay, I heard a big yes over there. I had, you got to watch Stephanie now. But uh, seriously, just because someone abuses that position doesn't mean that it's not a legitimate position. Same thing with a, a government official. Anybody know any corrupt government officials? <laughs> Anybody know any government officials that aren't what they ought to be? Well, yeah, of course we do. But that doesn't mean that the government isn't ordained of God. And just because some folks are not doing the job like needs to be done doesn't mean you throw out the baby with the bathwater. We understand that. And uh, one of the things, Wayman Miller, uh, and this is another thing I draw your attention to, the second Denton lecture that ever came out, Brother Gary Workman, who I've always had a lot of respect for, uh, him and Wayman Miller basically had a debate in that lectureship book, and it's a good read. But one of the things that I think that you'll see, Brother Miller's basic complaint is that elders oftentimes abuse that authority. Well, with that argument, you could go anywhere. You could say, well, we just need to get rid of husbands. We need to get rid of, you know, principals in the school. Uh, you could go anywhere with that. So beware of that as we talk about some of the things we're going to be talking about tonight. Verse 1 says, the elders which are among you, I exhort, Peter says, who am also an elder. Now, Peter was an elder, and it's interesting because uh, those who would like to say that Peter was the first pope, they've got a problem because Peter can't be a pope and be the husband of one wife. And he says he's an elder, so we know that he's a husband of one wife because that's part of the qualifications. Just as it was Peter's mother-in-law who Jesus healed. So you've got some real problems there with those today who want to say Peter was the first pope and and uh, then they've got to, under, you know, try to explain why popes can't be married. Well, he says, who am so also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. I mean, firsthand, Peter saw that. And also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God. If you were to look at that in the original language, the word feed and the word flock, they're practically the same exact word. They have the idea of tending sheep, of being a shepherd, of watching, those, the, watching the, the flock. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. That's the word episkopos. Uh, it means exactly that, an overseer. But you'll have people who try to explain that away with verse 3. But the bottom line is words mean things. Feed the flock of God, shepherd the flock. The shepherd leads the flock. He doesn't drive it, as we'll look at later. He leads the flock, but he takes the oversight thereof. Not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. Now, that's the sugar stick. That's the passage they like to bring up and say, okay, listen. These elders don't have authority. They can't be lords over the heritage. They can't be lords over God's heritage, but being ensembles. And you'll even have men, even men who I have a lot of respect for, uh, Jack P. Lewis, who is one of the teachers, I believe, at Freed. I'm not sure if he's retired now or not. But he goes to a, a lot of, he, he kind of has this lean, leaning as well. And he attacks, basically, I, I, I hate using the word attacks, but he just writes against Hebrews chapter 13 at verse 17, one of the verses we'll be looking at here in a minute. And he says that those words might not really mean what we think they mean. Well, that, that means they, they might do it, you know. And one of the things that this is a book called Exegesis of Difficult Bible Passages. And this by Brother Lewis. And hey, listen, I'm telling you, if the man's name's on it, I recommend you buy it. It's good material. Most of the time, you're going to find very little, especially when it comes to the old prophets, the minor prophets, the major prophets. <coughs> Brother Lewis has done some great, uh, great work. Well, he makes the argument against Hebrews 13, 17, and one thing that I did notice about it, that in this book, it's only got about 15 different uh, passages he talks about. He uses three pages. It's very, very brief. He doesn't have a whole lot to say about it. Uh, I appreciate him writing on it, but we do definitely come to different uh, understandings of that passage. But being an ensemble to the flock, I don't think this kills verse 2. Verse 2 says, feed the flock, tend the flock, Take the oversight thereof. Folks, an overseer is responsible for the grounds, if you will. He oversees what's taking place. And I think the warning here is simply that. Don't gloat it over people. Don't ram it down people's throats. And he says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory, a taste doxes Stephanos, a crown of glory that fadeth not away. 
That word fadeth not away comes from a particular Greek word that's dealing with a flower that never doesn't, that always blooms. It never stops blooming. It's a really beautiful picture in the original. Well, let's think about elders in the New Testament for a minute. Let's kind of go back and just look at some things that I know that we know. But remember, there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. There was a, a generation that came along, and our children need to know and need to understand the work of elders, the responsibility of elders, and we need to be training our young men. Sawyer needs to one day, Eli needs to one day be elder in the Lord's church. Cameron should be being trained to be a, an elder in the Lord's church. Jack, and I hope I don't miss any of these other young fellows, but they need to be thinking about the leader because that's where it starts. You can't wake up one day when you're 50 and decide, hey, you know what, I think I'm going to start preparing myself to be an elder in the Lord's church. It, it can be done. I'm not saying that's too late, but it's kind of difficult. It's kind of difficult to get in all the things that you need to be qualified. So let's talk about elders in a minute. for a minute. In the New, the New Testament church, very quickly organized, had elders and deacons. And yes, I believe probably part of the miraculous is involved there. Acts 14.23 and when they had ordained them elders in every church, now we're talking about Paul's first missionary journey, uh, but, you know, a lot of the folks that were obeying gospel, the gospel were people who had known about God for a long time, a lot of your Jews and synagogues and so forth, but I can't help but think that there's part of the miraculous element there, of course. Men having their hands laid on, you know, the apostles laying their hands, uh, Paul laying his hands on these men, they immediately would have wisdom and so forth, the gift of faith, the gift of knowledge, uh, and so forth. Uh, so you, they ordained in them, or ordained them elders in every church. And brethren, I know probably most of you have been someplace before or attended services where there is not an eldership. I have worked under an eldership. I have worked where there is not an eldership. And let me tell you, as a preacher, it is much better to work with elders. It's a tough thing when you get in a room with 25 men, some having been members of the church for 100 years and some being members of the church for two months, Yet when the things, the decisions are made, everybody has kind of an equal voice. And that's a difficult thing. So elders, but, but at the same time, you've got to make sure that when you ordain elders that you go by the qualifications. Those qualifications are there for a reason, not a novice, and so on and so forth. We'll look at some of those as we go along. But it's much better. That's the way, what I mean much better. Here I am telling God his plan's good. That's God's plan, okay? Elders in the church. And when there's not elders in the church, there's something lacking there, as we're going to see uh, when we look at Titus, when Paul talks about the reason he left him there, to you know, take care of the things that were wanting. And, of course, one of those things was the fact there was no elders. Uh, there's always a plurality in the eldership. Acts 20 at verse 17, I know that you've heard the war stories. I have too as well. I can take you to a congregation right now in this valley that had an elder who didn't have any children. And you might say, well, he can't be an elder, and I would say, amen. But that doesn't mean that it didn't take place, okay? I, I know a place. I can tell you. I can take you there. They had one. It had been 100 years ago, maybe, but it was, uh, they didn't have, the man didn't have children. So there's a qualification you know that he didn't have. How in the world did he get into the eldership? Well, a lot of those brethren, uh, a lot of times people just observe the Passover, or they look at the, the things they want to see, and they pass over the, the other things. Always a plurality in Scripture. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church, not just one. Acts 21, 17, and when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went into uh, James, and all the elders were present. There's always a plurality of elders in the New Testament. You can't just have one. When you do that, you step outside of Bible authority. The work of elders can be seen in the use of terms that are used interchangeably in the scriptures. And that's why it's sometimes hard to, to, to deal with these words. As a matter of fact, in the uh, spiritual sword that I was telling you about, it's really incredible. Uh, they donate two pages, two entire, two entire pages. As a matter of fact, they deal with every Greek word that is uh, used in scripture uh, dealing with uh, elders. And it, it's something to behold. I mean, it, it's a great thing. I may make copies of this if you would like them. But every word in the Greek and its English equivalent is dealt with because it's ungetoverable. We'll see one of the words later on is, is the, the word for a steward, uh, oikognomos, which oikos is home, nomos is law. Remember Joseph 
was this kind of thing. He was a steward over Potiphar's house. In other words, he ran everything in the house. That word is used uh, for the eldership. And obviously we see from words that we know what oversight means. But a lot of times you'll have fellows jump back into Greek and they try to say, hey, this word can't mean that, when actually it means just that. And so uh, we have to be careful of that. And I'm glad that we have this uh, chart, of course, put together by Thomas B. Warren. And I'm just glad that we have faithful gospel preachers. I'm grateful for men like Garland Elkins and Curtis Cates and so many that we could go on, Guy and Woods and all these men and that they, they have written. And brethren, I think that's why it's so important that we pass these writings and teachings to our children because what's being written today a lot of times is just, it's not worth the paper it's on. Modern scholarship is definitely not, uh, not where we want to go as far as the undermining the scriptures. Notice some of the descriptions. They're called elders means just enhanced in the word is the idea of aged. They have more years of life. They're elders. They're older folks. Pastors, the idea of, of one that tends, that tends. A pastor is a flock, a shepherd, if you will. Um, a pastor does not have to be the preacher, okay? We misuse that term in this country, particularly in this area. Uh, I am not a pastor. I am what's called an evangelist or a preacher. And you might say, well, boy, you're being kind of technical there. Well, sometimes you, you need to be a little technical. I am not one of the overseers of this flock. We have four men who oversee this flock, and I am not one of them. I am a preacher. However, there are some congregations, like the Jasper Church, for instance. The Jasper Church, uh, Bruce Leonard serves not only as the preacher, but as the elder. And that's biblical. That can take place. But just because a man stands in the pulpit doesn't necessarily mean he is the pastor, okay? A pastor is one that meets those qualifications from 1 Timothy 3. It's an office that he fills. They're also called bishops, which has this hint, sense of one that's over, an overseer and shepherd. In Acts 20, verse 17 and verse 28, the elders are called overseers, bishops, and charged to shepherd the church. Titus 1, verses 5 through 7, notice the verses here. They're used together. Uh, Paul, writing to Titus, says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly, for a bishop, notice he's talking about the same thing. He hasn't changed uh, lines of reasoning. He's talking about the same office, but in verse 5 he calls them elders, and now he calls them bishops. He's not confused. It's just different words for the same office. A bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, and not given to filthy lucre. 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2, the elders are told to shepherd the flock, serving as overseers. As older men, therefore, they are to watch over the flock and to tend the sheep. Our responsibility to the elders, notice with me these passages. Our responsibility, of course, is to recognize, but not only recognize, Respect them and respect the office, just like an evangelist. I have an office in the church as far as an evangelist is an office. It's a position, if you will. It's not one that you necessarily have to meet qualifications, but that's determined by the eldership. They determine who's going to be the one that preaches. That's one of the ways they exercise feeding the flock of God. But our responsibility is to recognize and respect them. Now, I realize I am not the greatest preacher that's ever been, far, far from it. And our elders may not, you may think, well, they're not the greatest elders that have ever been. But the Bible tells us that we need to love these men, including myself, for the position that they're in. Love them for their work's sake. Notice the following verses. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. We beseech you, brethren, know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Now, I think that's just one of those passages. How do you get past that? And a lot of, the, a lot of fellows, you'll see, try to explain that away. But it's just, you know, it's pretty simple English. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Let the elders, notice in verse 17, that rule, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. The idea of ruling and doing it well, uh, to me that sounds like you have some type of authority, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his re reward. Well, now, we talk about this passage many times dealing with whether or not the preacher should be paid. But do you realize in the context here, it's talking about an elder being paid. 
there's authority for and probably more so than the preacher of the elders who were full-time in their work. And apparently that was exactly what was taking place in some congregations in the first century. Verse 19, against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. Not only should we recognize and respect them, but to obey and be submissive when they lead scripturally. When they are making decisions that are right, that are based on God's word, and they're not making up laws that God hasn't made, then I have a responsibility to follow the shepherd. I have a responsibility to be submissive and obey. Notice Hebrews 13, 17. Now, this is the one that Brother Lewis would say, well, we don't know that that word means that. I'm, I do appreciate the fact that he doesn't say, we know for sure it doesn't mean that. So he does leave the possibility open. And first, you know, frankly, I don't know why you'd want to really lay that uh, down. Anyway, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls. You see the responsibility that a man takes on when he takes on the role of an elder? Not only is he going to give an account for himself, but he steps up to the plate and says, you know what? I'm going to take an account. I'm going to give an account for others as well. That's huge. You're talking about self-sacrifice. You're talking about being willing not only to stand on judgment day and give an account of yourself, but they watch for your souls as they must give an account that they may do it with joy. Now, isn't that what you would like for the man who's watching over your soul to be able to experience that job with joy? Not grief, not sadness. I have watched our elders, most of our elders, I, I might, but I, men that have served in the past and men who serve now, I have watched them shed tears when we have talked about things. I have watched them brokenhearted talking about situations that, that grieve their souls. Because they love the flock. I mean, it's not a job that you do if you don't love people and you don't love the church of God. And not with grief. That's right the opposite of what we want people looking out for our souls to feel, isn't it? Don't you want to be an asset to the church and not a liability? Don't you want those men to know they can come and count on you and to appreciate you and know they can trust you instead of always wondering, you know, what's happening with them? Where's their soul? You know, are they... Are they being faithful? They're not here again. Can, what can we do? It's, it's, it's amazing. For that is unprofitable for you. 1 Peter 5, 5, which is the next verse in what we're looking at. Uh, now, this can, can be just older people in general, but I think the principle is still the same. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. If we're supposed to submit ourselves just to older people and have respect, then certainly that follows uh, the case with uh, the eldership. Uh, I, I believe so. And that's one thing that I would love for our country to get back to doing a little bit more of, and that's having a little respect for older folks. You know, that just is something like we've lost. Well, let's look real quickly at Peter's exhortation to the elders. First of all, shepherd the flock of God. Remember what I told you? If you looked at that word flock and you looked at that word shepherd, in the original, you'd have a whole lot of trouble telling much difference about them. It's the idea, same thing. The flock, a shepherd, the one that leads the flock. One of the things you have to be is able to teach. I just had to know. I keep seeing that thing go on and off. I just had to know whether it was on or not. Able to teach. Brethren, that is something that an elder, either in a classroom setting or on a one-to-one -one setting or even with his life, uh, the way he lives his life, you know, we can teach that way. But I believe what happens here is, is a situation where a man needs to be able to sit down and be able to tell somebody what to do to obey the gospel, able, able to teach must be able to stop the mouths of the gainsayers. That's when a man stands up and teaches that which is wrong or in another place. You know, an eldership has the right to, you know, write some folks that they know are writing, you know, bad things, maybe in journals, things of this nature. But to be able to stop the mouths of the gainsayers. Now, I'm not saying they have a authority over a fellow that's writing in a journal, but I tell you what, they have the right to and should speak up when that which is wrong is being taught. Uh, stop the mouths of the gainsayers would certainly be applicable in the congregation. And boy, I look back at, at situations where I just would give anything if the elders in that church had to stood up and told these preachers to hush, you know, teach the truth. But what we find many times is the preachers are telling the elders exactly what they want to hear. Uh, we think of folks that, you know, just that come to mind, you know, some of the great folks that have led so many congregations away just in the last 25, 30 years. It would have been great if elderships had to stand up and said, listen now, uh, we love you, 
But you're not going to teach that here. That's not Bible. That's not what's right. Let's get back to what's right and uh, drive on. And if they won't, bottom line is let them go. You know, get rid of them. We must, uh, they must take heed to themselves. Notice this. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. Elders are men that must think about themselves. You know, it jumps out to me that one of the very first things Paul talks about apostasy is going to take place in the eldership itself. Even from your own selves shall men uh, arise. So that's something they need to be aware of. And notice which is among you. No elder has overseer authority outside the congregation where he serves. Our eldership can't tell the bunch of Jasper or Kimball or Rocky Springs or Stevenson or wherever, you know, what they need to be doing. They do not oversee outside of the local congregation. Our, uh, you know, the Bible teaches autonomy, and that's the way it should be, shouldn't it? I mean, local men know what's happening at the local church. They're able to handle the local situations. You don't write to Nashville to find out what we need to be doing in South Pittsburgh. Acts 20, 28, notice until over the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, the local church. We know that because this is a bunch of guys that he sent to Miletus was our elders from the church at Ephesus. And that's where they had their authority. That's where they were doing their shepherding. Notice serving as overseers. To me, that's just hard to get over. You know, if you want to argue the eldership doesn't have authority, what do you do with this? You know, serving as overseers. Eh, not really. No, it's what it says. Serving as overseers. The eldership are overseers of the congregation. Oversight. Notice, though, it is as a servant. Being an elder is one of a servant, not a lord. We understand that. We understand that principle. Not by constraint, but willingly. A man cannot be forced to serve. As many times as I would like to have tried that a few times at my previous work, can't do it. Very first qualification we run across in the Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 3 at verse 1, Paul says, It is a true saying, if a man desire. And it's pretty cool because that word in the Greek is oregano. Oregano. And so isn't that like a spice you used to? Isn't there an oregano? And so, see, you've learned something today. You go home and put some oregano on your whatever. It's desire. A man must desire the office. Let me show you a couple other ways this word's used, exact word. Uh, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after. They wanted it. You see, that? that's how that word's used. It's something that a man wants. He covets it after here. And notice in Hebrews eleven sixteen. 16, but now they desire a better country. Who's that talking about? The patriarchs. And what were they looking for? Heaven. It was something they were working towards. So a uh, uh, man's wanting money. You know what he wants. He's coveting that money. These fellows wanted heaven. It was something they desired. Well, 1 Timothy 3, 1 says, if a man's going to be an elder, he's got to desire it. You can't uh, push somebody in there with a, with a pitch for it. But, on the other hand, I've always tried to encourage men to, to do what's right. And when a church needs elders, there's duties and there's responsibilities, and there's some things our ladies can't do for us, fellas. And guys, there's, there's some things that we have to prepare ourselves for because there's going to be a generation that's, they're going to die off. And uh, my son gave me a, a great compliment today, and I won't tell you everything he said, but he was just saying, Dad, you know, you're recognized, especially at Bible camp, as one of the, you know, solid, sound teachers. And I, I thought, well, our Bible camp, everybody there is solid, sound. So, you know, I'm, I'm real tickled with that. But he says, what are we going to do when men like you and Freddie Clayton and Roger Campbell, what are we going to do when you're dead? I don't know if he has any plans for me or not, but uh, I thought to myself, and I looked at him, and I said, well, you're going to do it. That's how it works. You see, we train, 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 train up the generation that comes behind us, and folks, you have to step in the gap. Just like in the days of Nehemiah, when they were rebuilding the wall, when there was a hole in the wall, somebody had to fill it. Some man had to stand in that gap. So there comes a time, fellas, when sometimes we have to bear the responsibility, even though we may not want to do that. You know, it might not be the, the thing that it just uh, really gets us up in the morning, but there's also a sense of responsibility. And if we love God and we love our families and we love the church, it's, it's just a role that sometimes you're going to find yourself needing to fill. And so let me encourage you now when you're younger to desire that office. You see, that's something I've always wanted to be since I became a member of the Lord's Church. I, I, I desire to, to be an overseer, desire to be a didn't desire to be a preacher, but I was trying to. It's funny how that works out, isn't it? But I, I wanted to be an elder in the Lord's church one day because I realized there's a need for that. Uh, 
There's need for preachers. There's needs for deacons. There's need for all types of leadership, uh, but especially elders. Because, brethren, you don't. We have been so blessed at this congregation. Within 20 miles of this place, we can find Buku churches. They don't have elderships. They don't have men who are willing to look out for your soul, take you up the valley even farther, and it gets more sparse. Bledsoe County, there were 14 congregations of the Lord's people, and if I'm not mistaken, there were two with elderships. Now, I just that's off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure uh, that's not good numbers. That's not, uh, and what's happened? A lot of times people just don't want to do it. They just don't want to do it. And a lot of times congregations don't want elders. Now, that's a twofold thing. Sometimes congregations don't want elders. And why is that? They don't want to be under nobody. They want to do what they want to do. They want to run the show themselves. So we have to be careful. Have to be careful. Uh, a man cannot be forced to serve. And, you know, folks, the minute a man loses that desire, he probably should think about resigning. I mean, if it's not a fire that burns in you, then you're, you're probably not going to have the, uh, not have the ability to, to suffer as he ought. Uh, that should be serve, and I did correct that once, but I guess I saved it wrong. Should be able to serve as he ought. Uh, it's something that's got to, you got to have a desire there. Got to have a desire. And I'm not saying that, you know, that desire has to be so burning 110 miles an hour every day, but if you get to the point where it's a dread and, and not a love, then, you know, that first qualification, a man must desire that office. So, you know, we have to keep that in mind. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Now, we've looked before, and I, in 1 Timothy 5, 17, 18, is talking about an elder. And it's talking about don't muzzle out the ox and tread at the corn. That's talking about he's being supported for the work that he does in the church. That's exactly what that's saying. But that can't be his motivation, okay? shouldn't be money. And, and, and that's pretty common sense. Not as being lords over those entrusted to you. Well, we understand that. Peter could have told them what to do, but instead he practiced what he preached. You remember that when Paul says, I could have enjoined you to Philemon in the book of Philemon. He says, I could, I could have adjourned, you know, in other words, I could have commanded you. As an apostle, I have that authority. But I'm not going to do that, Paul would say. I'm going to, I'm going to just ask you as a brother. Well, what's that going to do if you're the brother being asked? Well, you're going to, well, for sure, you're going to do that, you know. Well, that's exactly what Peter does here. He doesn't command them. He doesn't command them. But he leads by an example. Don't be a dictator. A sobering thought is the trust that is put into the eldership's care. Remembering those men are looking out for your soul. Many have made this a sugar stick passage, say they have run to the other side of truth. You know, you have those who have a legitimate complaint that there are men sometimes that abuse the eldership. Well, the husbands, you name the office. There's men that abuse it, governments and all so on. But it's, so they just say, you know, forget it. We won't have any kind of eldership. And so this is the place that they try to go, and I just don't believe it's there. You know, what are you going to do with verse 2? You just can't cancel that out. They are upset with, old, with elders who lord over the flock, and rightfully so. And our good congregations would stand up with them and say, you know, that's right. You shouldn't have men that, that lord it over the church and run it like dictators. That, of course, a, a shepherd that meets the qualifications and loves the flock, it's going to be like that. But they look at Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. That's one of the proof texts now. And they'll say, Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. And so they say, We're casting out all authority. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister or servant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Can you not see right there? Authority as far as encapsulated in a man is cast out. Well, as Brother Woods and many other good Bible commentators over the years have looked at, you know, have answered, what's the context? What's he trying to get them to see about the, you know, the Gentiles have people that, you know, thrust it down. Look what happened. In verse 20, they then came to him, mother of uh, Zebedee's children, with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. What does she want? And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left of thy kingdom. That's the context. Zebedee's wife brings, uh, what's her name, Simone, I believe, <coughs> brings James and John and says, and the Lord says, what do, you, what do you want? And she says, I want James to be on one side and John on the other side when you come to kingdom, when you, go to, when you establish your kingdom. 
But Jesus says, are you able to suffer the things that I'm suffering with, be baptized with the things I'm to be baptized? And they said, yes. And he says, indeed, you will be. But what you're asking, I cannot grant. And then he uses that illustration of the Gentiles. He's trying to teach them that the greatest office in the church is going to be the one of a servant, of the elder, of the one who's looking out for others, their best interest, seeking to help them and please them. Uh, and uh, so a lot of guys, they look at that passage, but they don't look at the context and what it's being written in. Well, Peter continues the exhortation to elders, but being an ensemble to the flock, just as sheep are led and not driven, so it is with people. Elders have to live the life, and they have to lead by example. Just as a shepherd, as we said, leads the flock, he doesn't get behind them and beat them with a stick, you know, and, and drive them. Motivation to heed the exhortation. What kind of, you know, here, how does Peter, boy, that's a lot, Peter. Uh, what's in it for me? Well, when the chief shepherd shall appear, you, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. That's just one of those beautiful things that just sings in the original language. It's a tes doxes stephanos, the crown of glory. Now, I got lucky. I got a, a stephanos in this life. But some of us are looking for a, a Stephanie in the afterlife, another Stephanos, that crown of glory. And Peter says, when that chief shepherd shall appear, Jesus Christ, that one, that chief shepherd shall appear, you're going to have your reward, elders. And, they're, and even in this life, uh, they're worthy of double honor because of all the things that they go through. Not only are they worthy of double honor, but when you have a problem with an elder, it's one of those things that you only bring it in front of two or three witnesses. That's because the, the job's so difficult. Conclusion. Those who serve as elders are certainly worth the crown of glory. And hopefully, as we better understand their work, we'll, we will esteem them very highly uh, for their work's sake. Maybe we don't like them too much. You know, maybe there's a personality issue or something of that nature. I, I don't know how you can't like a man that, that, that loves you and is doing, doing everything he can for you. Uh, we'll esteem them for their work's sake. Not only that, if we understand their work, we will, be, we will be obedient. We will obey and be submissive so that they can watch for their souls. Now listen, with all of that said, I do realize from time to time that there are men who preach who really ought not be preaching. They just don't have what it takes. First of all, in their own lives, they don't practice what they preach. Now, I'm not saying anybody's perfect. But a lot of times we know there's a lot of folks who are doing some things they ought not to be doing, and many of them are in pulpits. That's the same thing with elders. Not every eldership is what it ought to be. Um, we know that. We can be like Marshall Keeble would say, fruit inspectors. But as long as our elderships are qualified men, and they are doing the work of an elder. Now, the work of an eldership is one to oversee the flock, particularly, especially, and I guess I should say only in matters of expediency. You see, the eldership, as, as good as they are and as great as they are and as authoritative as, as they have, they can't come up and say, well, you know what? We're going to start taking the Lord's Supper on Thursday afternoon. We just, this Sunday thing is just a real bummer, and so we just think it'd be a whole lot more, you know. They don't have the authority to do that. You see, that has already been stated. On the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. They can't change that. They can't change the Lord's declaration of the marriage covenant in Matthew 19. They can't say, well, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, you can be remarried for any reason. They don't have that kind of authority. But when it comes to, you know, let's try to assemble three times a week. Let's try to, uh, let's, let's meet at 10 o'clock for uh, Bible study. We'll have worship service at 9 a.m. Uh, let's support this work. Let's support that work. This is a good work. That's a good work. It'd be great if we could support every work there is. But, you know, as well as I do, we don't have the means. But these men choose the works, and based on the, what they think the work will do, and we should encourage them in that, and we should help them in that. One of the ways, of course, we help the eldership is we keep our, you know, we do our part. And that, that has to do with giving. You know, a lot of times you'll see a congregation, the, the, uh, the budget may be a certain amount, and they never make it. Well, what's that going to cause the eldership to, to do the next year? They're going to have to lower that, you know, and so they're going to have to cut programs. They're going to have to cut things. But these are all things that fall into the expediency uh, of the eldership. They can't make up laws for God, but they can make up and, and do have the right to lead the church uh, in these matters that we've talked about as far as expediency, not matters of faith. You can't change that baptism is 
for the remission of sins, not that they would. But I do realize that sometimes there's elderships that are not what they ought to be, and a lot of times there's men serving in the eldership that shouldn't be there. And I'm not going to name anybody. I don't know anybody right offhand, but I'm sure you've probably met a, a few in your life. And that is something that, you know, each congregation has to deal with, and each congregation has to, to work through that. Elders are appointed, uh, you know, but once an elder gets to the point where a flock won't follow that elder anymore, it's kind of a situation where they're unappointed, if you will. Uh, same, same kind of system there. We don't read in the Bible how exactly you install a man into the eldership, you know. Do you announce it on Sunday morning and give the congregation a few weeks? These are areas that we do, but we don't have any book, chapter, and verse on that. Uh, but these are ways we see a man must meet the qualifications. Okay, once he's met that qualifications, what do we do? And that's kind of left up into the hands of the congregation to say, hey, yes, we'll follow this man. There's nothing wrong with him. We're, we'll, you know, we don't find anything biblically uh, why he couldn't do that. So these are all matters that we, we know and we deal with all the time, but maybe we don't give as much thought to as, as maybe we've had a chance here tonight. Like I said, if any of this material that you'd like to have a copy of, it's a good read. Uh, there's many words. I mean, they go on to talk about, there, there's so many passages they deal with and deal with in the original, uh, and it, it's a good good material. I better not set that there. I'll knock it off. But you're more than welcome to anything I have along those lines. Hopefully this has been a good study for you. Uh, the, the words of Peter, you know, uh, the, the elders are going to have that crown of glory, and then he starts in verse 5, where we'll pick up next week. We need to submit ourselves uh, not only to the elders but uh, to each other as we'll see next week. Perhaps you're here tonight and you're not a member of the Lord's Church, not a, not a faithful Christian. Let me encourage you. These things about uh, elderships and so forth, that's uh, kind, of, kind of not <laughs> real important if, if you're in your sins. Uh, the most important thing you need to do is when you leave this building tonight is be right with God. No matter what happens then, uh, wreck or anything of that nature, you're, you're taken care of. As we looked at this morning, knowing that's not the context, but in James 4.14, the principle's there. Uh, we don't know what's going to be tomorrow. So make sure you don't leave here unprepared to meet God. If we can help you in any way, we encourage you to come. As together we stand and sing.